I mean, Lincoln was capable of great self-reflection. I think that was one of his keys as a leader, is he could step back and say, I can see myself behaving in a certain way, and I can reflect on that, and I can see I need to change and, and adapt uh, at some level. That's a remarkable uh, you know, human gift, and, uh, and he had it, and, and it's something to be emulated. Welcome to Seeking Excellence. I'm Brett Pinniger. Professionally, I'm a leadership advisor and organizational consultant. I've also spent more than nine years with my sleeves rolled up as a tech CEO. My mission is to strive to live and lead with excellence and to help you do the same. This podcast is for people that want to take their lives and their leadership to the next level in spite of the challenges they face. They want to continually improve their work, their relationships and themselves. Entrepreneurs, students, people active in their communities, influencers like you that want to up their game. In this episode, you'll have the opportunity to listen in on my conversation with Matt Holland, the president of Utah Valley University in Orem, Utah. You're going to love our interview. It's full of ideas and wisdom for all of us about becoming the leader we want to be. First, let me introduce myself and the story behind this podcast. While leading a tech company in 2014, I began to experience the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Thankfully, my symptoms remain mild. However, my diagnosis has caused me to step back and reflect on where I want to focus. I've come to more profoundly understand that even though plans, tactics, and many other things are necessary, the foundation of any organization's success flows from people who are striving to do their best. Just a few months ago, I decided to step down and focus my work exclusively on helping leaders and teams be more productive. I do this through training, coaching, and executive peer group programs, and of course, this podcast. You can find out more about my work at brettpinniger.com. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram at Brett Pinniger. Check out the show notes for all the specifics. Now let me introduce you to Matthew Holland, president of Utah Valley University. Matt was appointed president in 2009, and under his leadership, UVU has adopted a unique educational mission focused on student success. As a result, it has experienced unprecedented growth and is now the largest institution of higher education in the state of Utah. In addition to his accomplishments as a leader, much of Matt's graduate work involved the study of leadership approaches of politicians, including Abraham Lincoln, who we'll be talking more about during our discussion. As you listen, you may reflect upon three themes that I noticed. One is the paradox of confident humility. Listen closely as Matt describes his being selected the president of UVU. Another is self-awareness and why we probably are not as aware as we think we are and what it takes to cultivate. And finally, why caring deeply about people is the first order of business for every leader. With that, let's dig in. Matt, it is great to be with you. So good to see you, Brett. Thank you. We've known each other for a long time. We go way back. We probably shouldn't devolve uh, we, much, we, much further. Exactly. Could get us exactly. both in trouble. You're at the nearing the end of your tenure here at UVU. Uh -huh. You've learned a lot. You've yeah. done a lot. What really stands out in your mind as you look back at your tenure? Well, the fact that I could do it. <laughs> I mean, I, I got to be honest with you. When I first came into this job, I, I hadn't had a lot of formal uh, academic leadership uh, opportunities. And I think there was a question in a lot of people's mind and probably in my own, uh, if I'm honest about it, about could you really pull this thing off? And I think the fact that we've been able to do it, and I think we've made some great progress has been a real learning lesson for me, um, A, that I could do it and that I enjoyed it. I, yeah. That was another thing is it's one thing to do the job, but could you, could you relish it and, and find energy in it? And I clearly have. I've loved being the president of Utah Valley University. What have you loved the most? What's really sort of been nearest and dearest to your heart? Well, first and foremost is the students. I mean, I just, they bring an energy to this campus and to my life. I love working with, you know, especially that, that, uh, that age group. Now at UVU, we have students at all, at all levels of age. And I, I love that too. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of adults coming back, second chances and, and for, for new opportunities in life. And those are great stories. But 
something about working with 18, 19, 20 year old, you know, people who are just now mature enough to realize they got to get serious about life, but still young enough that they're looking for inspiration and direction and hope and, and uh, working with them is uh, just so uh, exhilarating. And then the second thing I, I have to say is, uh, you know, being part of uh, watching and, and helping to shape a very large organization, take on a particular direction and a cast and a set of achievements. Uh, that's just been a really fun thing to be part of. Well, it wasn't long before you joined UVU that it became a university. That's right. We'd been a, a originally a technical college, then a community college, state college. We'd just become a university the year before I took office. And I think the big question was, okay, you're a university, but what kind of a university? And I think what we've been able to do the last nine years is answer that question and, and do it in a way that I think was unique and innovative and, and uh, has really led to a, a lot of growth and, and success. You'd mentioned a few minutes ago that this was a, a chance, you know, a chance for you to step up to sort of prove yourself as a leader where you hadn't had a lot of academic leadership experience prior to this. Right. What do you think prepared you for that? Were there heroes that you looked to or people that you looked to in your life that would represent ideals that you would that you strived for? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, th I think it's a great question. And I, th I think if you pulled the the regents and others who made the decision is one of the things that they looked at was, yeah, he's not been a department chairman or a dean or a vice president, but he's clearly, you know, kind of steeped himself in leadership, studying it, right. thinking about it, working with people who are leaders. And and one of the things that I've discovered uh, in this process and, and, and that has helped me is that uh, is that I, I learned from a whole slew of very different leaders. Uh, folks who had different styles, different approaches. And I learned that leadership could come in very different forms. And that what I needed to do was kind of find my own form mm -hmm. that was an amalgam of things that I learned from other people and just my own intuitions about it. So for me, it, it starts probably with my father. Um, uh, he's a great leader. Uh, he, he was his own academic leader. He was a university president. Now, when people hear that, they think, oh, well, you were destined or that, you know, you were you were programmed or trained. I never thought I would be a university president growing up. I watched my dad. I thought, I don't want that job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but life is quirky how it turns out. And it was a unique opportunity. And and so both because of his role of watching him as a university president, but also he's a he's a noted ecclesiastical leader in the yeah. LDS church uh, serving in the Quorum of the Twelve. Uh, he's just had such a powerful influence on my life to show me how to lead with love, with integrity, uh, with a, a kind of a hope and a faith for good things to happen. And um, I think about him a lot in that role. But but he's really just the starting point. I can think of, you know, our mutual friend Mark Fuller. Yes. Uh, watching him create Monitor Group uh, from out of nothing, more or less, and into a large international uh, consulting firm, and I was able to work with him in the office. He's a very different man indeed, than my father, indeed, as you know. Indeed, uh, But I, I learned a lot from it. Watching him kind of set the mission, vision, values of Monitor Group, which I was able to help with, was a powerful learning lesson for me that I drew upon, that I didn't get at Duke graduate school. I didn't get as part of a PhD program. I was drawing on those Monitor experiences when I came here to say, what kind of a university are we going to be and how do we articulate that and how do we get the whole, you know, institution to buy in? So, so you talk a little bit about kind of plans. Yeah. Mark being a great example of building plans, connecting it to vision, purpose, those sorts of things, but down into the practical, tactically, how do we do it? Yeah. And then you compare that to the, the values or the love or the authenticity that your father has. Right. Um, two uh, you know, two complementary things. There's yeah. some, nothing sort of very different about them, except when the plans and your love for people collide. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and, and sometimes that happens. It does, regularly, yeah. especially at a university. Indeed, yeah. I, I can only imagine. Yeah. And so as you think about that collision, yeah. um, what sort of stands out? What have you learned about leadership in the colliding of the reality of running an organization yeah. with the feelings you have for the people in it? Yeah. Well, uh, that's a great question, and I'll, I'll answer it by uh, looking to, a, to another uh, exemplar, if you will. So my, my graduate work and my early uh, academic professorial work was on the, 
the thinking and leadership of Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And talk about a guy who had to deal with collision. You know, Indeed. Uh, this was a guy who somehow at the end of all of this civil war and all of these boiling acids between all the different parties stands up at the second inaugural and says, with malice toward none, with charity for all, let us strive on to finish the work we are in. And somehow he was able to maintain that, that compassion and that sense of, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hate people. I'm really gonna try to love people. And yet, let us strive to finish the work we're in. Mm -hmm. We got to finish this war. The war's not done. We got to, there, there is a right and a wrong side here. We got to make sure the right thing happens. We got to hold people accountable. I got to have generals who fight, you know. Uh, and that is just a very tough kind of uh, push and pull, if you will. And the only thing that I've concluded is that the answer is, is that you're committed to both. You're committed to trying to keep that moral compass that says, I don't want my heart to get corroded. I don't want to become bitter. I don't want to hate people. Uh, but I also have a job to do. I've got to think through the issues. I've, I've got to try to get the, the right thing to happen. And, and every day is a constant battle to, to, to hold, hold those two things together uh, back and forth. Indeed. Well, you, I've, I've read part of your book, read an article that you wrote about the book and about Lincoln and his sort of progression as a leader. Yeah. You had mentioned one of his early speeches in the book and in the article about how he was very much a rule maker. Yeah. And rules are important. It's the rule of law that drives everything. Right. And even if they're bad rules, right. it, just for the sake of the, the institution, right. better to keep the rules. Yeah. Uh, and, and then you talk about his evolution as a leader, where he became um, there was something there to balance that. Yeah. And this, this sense of kind of compassion or charity that yeah. you mentioned here. Um, what do you think brought that about? Well, it's, it's, it's curious. I, I mean, Lincoln was capable of great self-reflection. I think mm. that was one of his keys as a leader is he could step back and say, I can see myself behaving in a certain way and I can reflect on that. And I can see, I need to change and, and adapt, uh, at some level. That's a remarkable, uh, you know, human gift. And, uh, and he had it and, and it's something to be emulated. And so as he did a self-reflection, I think he uh, looked at people around him that he admired. I think he turned to various sources, including religious resources. He became a, a much greater reader of the Bible, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, he never became, a, as he said, a, quote, a technical Christian, was never baptized right. or, or became an official member of a church. But he saw something moral and profound in the teachings of Jesus Christ that he thought were missing from his early, more rationalist, kind of enlightenment, reasoned, law-based way of looking at the world. Now, he never gave that, that former part up. He, to the very end, he was a lawyer. He mm -hmm. argued, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation was, was on these very rationalistic grounds about the rule of law and constitutional jurisprudence. But he, as you said, he added to that this, this greater capacity of kind of compassion and understanding and feeling to balance the rational legalistic side of things that made him that much more of a powerful leader. You talk about self-awareness being at the core of maybe what enabled that. You know, there is a self-awareness and maybe even below that a humility. Yeah. Do you think that that humility flowed from some of his weaknesses? He's known to have had depression, or at least that's what many people think. Yeah. Um, to what degree did his humanity, his his weaknesses, actually enable him to become a better leader because he was maybe a little more sort of aware of, of his feelings? I, I think that's clearly one of the separators for Lincoln. You know, it takes a certain sort of hubris to be the president of the United States, to say, hi, I want to rule over all of the rest of you. I'm that smart and I'm that good, you know. But so, uh, and, and that's why you, you, you tend to see these kind of attributes of hubris in that role. But Lincoln somehow had the confidence to say, I think I can do this. I think I should do this. But he was always aware and painfully aware of, of his limitations. He was aware of, of his physical appearance. He knew that he got made fun of for a kind of tall, yeah. gangly, homely looking guy. He knew the kind of demons in his own mind with depression and discouragement that he just had to kind of gut it out. Um, he had a tough marriage by that point that was not a lot of source of comfort and consolation. Uh, and I think all of that just made him a more sensitive soul. It made him more patient uh, with people. 
Sometimes people have argued he was maybe even too patient. Mm -hmm. He kind of let things go longer than he needed to. But I think often that came from the sense of they're sort of who they are. I'm sort of who I am. We just, we kind of got to work together. Um, And somehow that didn't immobilize him. He still was able to be a strong leader when he absolutely had to be strong. Uh, But it, it softened him in a way that was absolutely critical for holding together this thing that was just bursting at the seams, you know, not just north and south, but within his own cabinet, Indeed. Uh, within his own family and friend structure. And because of that sort of self-awareness of his own limitations, he was able to kind of hold people together and say, we're in this together. You got weaknesses. I got weaknesses. Let's figure out a way to make it, make it work together. So uh, self-awareness, yeah. humility. He had it. In fact, not only did he have it, but he surrounded himself with people that were frank and direct because they disliked him or were in fact opposed to his views in many cases. I mean, the uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin book, Team of Rivals, was all about this concept of Lincoln surrounding himself with people that were not like him in any way. Right. Let's now bring those ideas, the the idea of self-awareness, the idea of surrounding yourself with people that think differently um, to your own leadership style. Yeah. And um, what do you do to sort of make sure you're not um, sort of Missing the big picture yeah. and in your corner office here, not seeing things as they really are. Yeah. One of the questions I know sometimes is out there is, you know, why does Holland have this person, you know, uh, close or in this position or that position? They, they don't seem like him. And and, and, um, and and again, what I've learned, and I've learned it from Lincoln and, and, and his uh, kind of team of rivals inside, but, it, you know, there are other places, is that, I'm better off if I get a fuller picture, and I, I'm more likely to get a fuller picture if I am surrounded by people who don't see things exactly like I see them. And, you know, sometimes that can be, you know, annoying or it's like the pebble in the shoe, but other times it's like, no, I'd have missed that if I hadn't mm-hmm. have had that person with that lens in the room helping to speak up. So I do not like, you know, yes men, yes women. I like people who will speak their mind. Now, at some point, there are limits to that too. You've got to have some degree of collegiality and some degree of, you know, we're a team and we want to we want to move this forward. But, but I think consciously cultivating folks around you who bring in different perspectives, different attitudes, and are not afraid to speak those to me has been absolutely critical to the success we've had here at UVU. What do you do at that juncture where you need to go from the arguing to the committing? Yeah. And how do you orchestrate or choreograph that transformation? Because there is a point at which you want to have discussion, yeah. open, free dialogue. And right. then there's a point where yeah. the decision needs to be made. Either it's by consensus, either yeah. it's by a unilateral sort of a dictatorial, this right. is what we're going to yeah. do, or something in between. Yeah. So part of it starts before you even get there. It starts with are, are, even though we're going to have differences of opinion in application, in uh, day-to-day decision-making, do we at least all have enough of a philosophical commitment to what it is we want to achieve? If you've got that foundation right at the 30,000-foot level, what are the core values? What, what are, what's the mission and the vision of the institution? Uh, it's a, team, a, a team that's varied and differentiated that's operating off that similar foundation That's where I think the real power comes. If you have those foundational cracks and and dissension, then you got you got big problems on your. I'm not sure. I think Lincoln may have had to deal with that himself, but at least here at UVU, I've made we've made sure that the folks have that those core themes, core aspirations down, and then we can disagree, and then we can disagree, and we can get to the point to say, okay, we don't have consensus. A decision has to be made. I'm the decision maker. Here's what we do moving forward. Now, hopefully, uh, over time, what people see is, you know, Holland isn't deciding, you know, always in favor of one advisor versus another. There's a, uh, and and more often than not, we achieve consensus. And the overall arc of things suggests everybody's just trying to make their best faith effort to make decisions in a world of imperfect information, but predicated on a common vision about what we're trying to achieve. Love it. Love it. I think that is critical to the success of any organization, a family, you yeah. know, uh, a school, a business of, of any sort here. Especially, I, I imagine people that are listening to the podcast today are kind of wondering, well, you know, I've got this unique situation here where it's me and my brother. There are a lot of family-run businesses in the country. I mean, most businesses are owned by families. Yeah. 
where it's a little harder to say goodbye. Right. You know, you, yeah. you got to kind of work through things in the same way the Lincolns had to work through things and others have to work through things. Yeah. Um, what, what have you found when there's a disagreement with somebody, yeah. but where you need to sort of keep the relationship intact here? Yeah. Yeah. Are there any sort of ideals or philosophies or approaches you use to guide those kind of very sensitive conversations? Yeah. Well, I, I know there's a there, there's a whole literature out there on this, and I've dabbled in you know this this school of thought and that school of thought, uh, but a lot of it's just I guess something I've developed over time in terms of my own value system and and, and what I try to what I what I think is the right thing to do. So it, it starts by being committed to candor, mm-hmm. uh, and I think you you really do people a disservice when you're not candid, um, and sometimes uh, and this can be you know, this can take on geographic significance. There are parts of the world that are more candid than others, you know, or Utah is not New York City. <laughs> or Moscow, <laughs> you know, Russia. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, so some places it's easier to be candid um, and maybe easier to be too candid. I'll mm-hmm. get to that in just a minute. But um, but at least in the context of UVU and or Utah and, and this environment, we've had a kind of a culture building of say, we've got to level with each other when we see problems and we've got to learn to give feedback to each other. And we set up some structural mechanisms for doing that, some feedback loops and some, you know, uh, accountability mechanisms so that at least once a year, but usually more often than that, there's a chance to say, here's an issue and here's how you're dealing with it. And this is why this is a problem. Uh, Let me but, just pause you right yeah. there. Does that flow 360? Are you getting that feedback as well? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, we, uh, part of it's, um, uh, uh, manufactured, if you will, by the, uh, by the regents who mm-hmm. have oversight, who collect information from those who, uh, who report to me. Uh, some of it's invited by myself to say, uh, that I, I, I want the input about, you know, what can I do better? What, where do we have, uh, areas that we need to improve on? What do I need to do better to help you? carry out your role. So so when you get that feedback yeah. and your team sees you respond to it, um, how does that, how does that enhance trust if it does? Is, yeah. is, is, do they, is, are the, is their observation of you and your handling that feedback here as the president of the university change the way they view you and enable or deepen the, the relationships they have with you? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, one of the early compliments that I took was I want to, after one of these formal reviews, and again, we have multiple kind of mm-hmm. set sources of review and feedback, but after one of the formal reviews, one of the things the regents said that my team said is he has big ears. Uh, and what they meant is he, he listens to us, uh, and, and responds accordingly. Uh, now some of that's just substantively, well, what should we do? And I'm listening to their ideas, but I think it's all was also the, here, here are things that you could do better. Or here's an area where we're just not hitting it, you know, in the right way. And 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 I made adjustments. And I think that, especially coming from the outside without a lot of administrative experience, that gave a lot of reassurance to the team. This is someone we can work with. This mm-hmm. is someone who is not just out telling us what to do all the time, but is open to feedback and instruction and self improvement. And I think that did a lot early on to build trust that built a teamwork dynamic that we've sailed on ever since. That's fantastic. You know, we talk about how Lincoln's sort of mindset, leadership mindset changed yeah. over time here. How has yours changed? What, you know, what, what's, what are some of the new ideas or different philosophies or approaches that you use now sort of towards the end of your tenure as compared to the beginning of your tenure? Well, one of the things I've uh, learned uh, and, and appreciated are the what I call the sort of the rhythms or seasons of leadership. When I first started, I thought I had to do everything all the time, day in, day out, month after month. And, and, and what I've learned is that's not sustainable, at least in a job like this. And so I do, I have learned that not only do I need to, but I, I, I can kind of pick and choose seasons where sometimes I have to be more focused on the external side of things, donors and legislators. But then I have to kind of make up for that to mm-hmm. loop back and say, I've got some internal work I need to do. I got to work with faculty or staff or my own team, and uh, and, and so I'm going to neglect some things. And then you throw the family into the mix, mm-hmm. and sometimes I just sort of have to say, I know things would go better professionally. I know I would do a better job as president of UVU if I were at this event or that event. 
but I'm going to go to the parent teachers conference or I'm going to go for a week, you know, in spring break in April, which is like the busiest season of time for indeed, me. Indeed. Uh, and, and I know I'm going to pay a little bit of a price, but, but I, but I'm not going to sacrifice my family and being a good family man has made me a better leader. So I'm borrowing here to pay for it there, but then I, I borrow there to go pay for it here. So what you're really talking about is not balance in the moment, exactly. but balance over time. Exactly. And and that, I think, has been one of the, the biggest shifts for me compared to that first year where literally I just thought I had to be everywhere all the time and I, I couldn't do it. But I'm also hearing a sense of um, that you can do enough and then you can do more than enough. Yeah. And that finding that right level, where, where, where do you redline? Where's the right optimal zone for Matt Holland to be functioning? Right. Sounds like you've really tuned that as well. Absolutely. So uh, you took a sabbatical. Yes. I don't know if that's unusual for university presidents or not, but uh, very exciting. Yeah, no. Uh, so that's, again, another one of those moments where you sort of have to read where the needle is. I qualified for a sabbatical after six years. Mm -hmm. I didn't take it. We were in the throes of one of our biggest legislative battles. Uh, we were in high growth, low resource mode. There were gaps that we had to close. I just, I just felt it would have been irresponsible for me to go away. Year seven came around, still the same thing. I just felt like it was too busy. But by year eight, it's like, okay, we, we kind of got through those big hurdles. Uh, we, got a, we got a good team in place. Um, now not only can I get, go away, I think it would be a good thing to go away. And one of the lessons for me in this, Brett, was – not only was it a great thing for me personally, it was great for my team. Hmm. For them to learn that they could function without me for three months, more or less. I mean, I really checked out. I mean, I maybe got four or five emails. I'm, I'm a, the senior vice president for academic affairs called me the first week I was gone. Asked, he asked me about a fairly sensitive question. I'm like, take care of it. And that, <laughs> he, said, he said, when you did that, I, like, I got the message like, okay, we're, we're doing this. And... Uh, they got through three months, and it was great. Now, I think people, you know, it's not like, well, you you were superfluous. You didn't need to come back. I think sure. there were things that needed to be attended to and needed my my uh, o oversight. But it was great for them, for me to go away, and it was certainly great for me to recharge my bat batteries intellectually, have time with my family, uh, spiritually, emotionally. I mean, it was just a really powerful thing to do. How do we transform what you were able to do in a university environment to leaders out there that may not be able to take a formal sabbatical in yeah. a normal business? What what advice would you give to people that are looking for a – that need a break? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I do think there's value in, um, in uh, a couple of principles. One is truly unplugging. I mean, the problem with our technological world is we, quote, take breaks – but we take our whole world with us. Mm -hmm. We take our cell phones and our laptops and we're on email every day. And I think you've got to have that time where if it's not, you know, three months. And and, and so my, when we say sabbatical, I was only gone three months. Typically a sabbatical is six to eight months. I right. couldn't have done that. So I had to collaborate that. Other CEOs or whatnot might not have able to do three months, but can you do two weeks? Mm -hmm. Can you do three weeks? And truly unplug, you know, maybe with that, you know, rarest of exceptions but also to geographically relocate, go somewhere different, put yourself in a different setting and not necessarily a vacation setting. I mean, yeah. it could be a professional development setting, but, but go somewhere where you're talking to different people, you're looking at a different landscape, you're reading different literature. Uh, those are the things Love I it. think you need to do to really, you know, spark creativity and, and frankly, uh, you know, we're, we've come back and there have been a whole slew of things, including uh, we're going to be hosting a, a national summit now on the dual mission institution that, that UVU has become. Uh, and, and we've got the heads of the systems from Wisconsin and Georgia coming, uh, governors from other states looking like they're participating. Uh, it's it's going to be quite a big deal. And that would never have come to me had I not gotten out of my context in a different set of uh, interlocutors, a different set of readings, and it's just spawned a whole new thing for us moving forward. So. Fantastic. I've got some, uh, some random questions yeah. here that are kind of meant to sort of bring us towards a close. Okay. And I just want you to think about these. So think about these questions here. And um, I know that they're all, um, they're all sort of one versus another thing. Yeah. And you may say they're both, but, but really try and pigeon, say, say, am I more X or am I more Y as you think about these? So, are you more likely to lead from the front or from the back? Uh, 
that's, you're probably looking for crisp answers. Um, no, it, these are complicated. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, that it's, it's, it's yeah. the gray zone. Yeah. Um, I, I think I'm more inclined to lead from, from the front, but I, I think people who would, who would assess me on that, that would say that I would spend a lot of time in the back listening first, mm -hmm. but, but then there comes a time where you've got to step out and, and be the guy when there's uncertainty and say, this is where we're going. Great. Great. Um, are you a big picture person or an in the details person? More big picture than in the details, although I got a little feedback early on that I might have been a little too in the details mm -hmm. uh, up front. Uh, so I, I clearly still like to have my hands on the levers at some level to make sure the big picture becomes real. But my, my biggest interest and, and, uh, and commitment, I think, is big picture. Are you more of a risk lover or a risk averse person? Well, all academics are risk averse <laughs> by nature, but I think within that, you know, uh, that uh, sort of uh, milieu, I'm a risk taker. I think we've done some things differently here, and I think we have to. I think education in particular is in this kind of moment of upheaval, and uh, we, we've had to do things different. I think by those standards, I'm a risk taker. Great, great. Would you describe yourself as internally or externally motivated? Uh, I think more internally motivated. And where does that internal motivation flow from? Uh, a lot of it comes from my faith, uh, a belief that uh, God has given me both a set of gifts and opportunities that I'm expected to make the most of. Uh, now, are there external incentives and, and uh, accentuators? Of course. But, but deep down inside, I just, I want to do the best I can possibly do with with what heaven has provided me and, and report accordingly. What's your communication style? Are you more of a direct, candid communicator or more the indirect kind of? I would say, um, I, I think the first word I would, I think I tend to be a diplomatic communicator. So I try to make things as smooth and artful as possible. Uh, but I, I think it's not diplomatic in the sense of avoiding the hard conversations. It's diplomatic uh, most of the time, but candid uh, when it needs to be. Thick-skinned or sensitive? Uh, probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, I, I take a lot of criticism in this job, and I've learned to just kind of let it roll off my back, uh, if you will. Uh, but, you know, I also know people who are more thick-skinned than I am. They don't even think about it when they go, I'd probably come home and like, eh, I, that wasn't really a lot of fun, you know, but, uh, but I'm back at it the next day and don't worry about it too much. So let's let's wrap up with the aspiring leader. Yeah, somebody who wants to become a better leader that may be a current employee at UVU or yeah. another academic institution. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give them? Yeah. What's the what's the key to success in this particular kind of environment? Yeah, well, there I think there are a few things that uh, that, that are vital. Uh, one is it it starts with the vision thing. You know, to quote George Bush. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it, 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 you know, do you have a picture for what a university can be, should be? Do you have a vision for your role in that as a leader? I think you've, you've got to have something like that moving forward. But, but beyond that, there's some things um, in a university setting, especially a public university setting, something that we haven't talked about. Uh, there, there's a skill set that I refer to as organizational agility. Hmm. There are so many different constituencies in an environment like this. So you've got to worry about a faculty culture. You've got to worry about a staff culture. You've got to think about student life. You've got to think about legislators that, you know, have a public responsibility. You've got trustees that you answer to. You've got donors who have their own dynamic. Uh, and then you've got administrators, senior administrators. And each one of these groups have a different flavor and style and preferred approach. And the people who prosper the most in a leadership setting at a university uh, or a place like UVU are people who can move between the different groups and adjust accordingly. You kind of learn to talk and work one way. And it's not that you're being insincere. You just learn there, there are different ways of doing business with each of these categories. And you've got to have that agility to move between all of them up and down and horizontally. And that's what I think, I think that's one thing that gets missed the most is mm. that people have a vision, they're bright, they want to commit to it, but they haven't quite figured out how to move between 
the different constituencies. Interesting. I think that, you know, whether it's at a university setting or a large corporation, there are lots of, of stakeholders. Yeah. And, uh, and it's about how you, how you manage your passions to get things done yeah. in that environment, knowing that there are many different sort of perspectives and needs and yeah. desires that everyone has here. That's a, that's a perfect phrase, managing your own passions, because you may think I've got a set of ideas, I've got a certain style, it's, it's served me well, I'm successful, I'm smart, I should just be able to kind of do that mm -hmm. all the time, every day, everywhere. And certainly what I think people learn when they come to UVU is, they have to learn to adjust and adapt and 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 you know evolve, if you will, depending on who they're talking to and when, if they're really going to get their passions implemented and achieved. And I think that's great advice for anybody anywhere. Yeah. Because there are passions can a little it can become um, so if we're overzealous in yeah. our passions, we we'll, we're in danger of them becoming nothing but dreams yeah. because we don't think practically about how to make things happen. Yeah. You've made things happen here, Matt. This yeah. has been a great uh, opportunity to get down, to, uh, to sit down with you and discuss what you've been able to accomplish here. What's next for you? Well, I've been called to be a mission president for the LDS Church. Uh, this uh, wasn't uh, something we're expecting, we were expecting, but we're absolutely delighted with it. My faith means everything in the world to me. We're going to go to Raleigh, North Carolina, which is where I did graduate school at Duke. So it's a little bit like going home. Uh, that's only a three-year assignment. After that, who knows what? Uh, <laughs> this is sort of a moment of adventure in our life. I've always been such a planner and and kind of you know trying to think through what 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 what's next. Uh, but we really could do I don't know a host of things when we come back. Certainly, education would be an area that we might get back into. Uh, you know, there was some talk um, in the community about public service. Uh, that could be a, a possibility. I have loved working with the business community mm -hmm. uh, and, and seeing the vitality and the creativity and what they do for economic development and for creating uh, wealth and opportunities for the citizens. So maybe I do something altogether different and, and do that. Uh, so we're just in for an adventure right now. And we, we've got our next phase ahead of us and who knows what after that. Well, that's kind of exciting. That's, yeah. the, that's the risk loving part of Matt Hall. Yeah, here. exactly. How do people follow you? Keep track of what you're doing. Uh, keep in touch with you. Well, I have not been the world's greatest social media guy with the exception I've been, a, I, I tweet, uh, and that's, that's my way to kind of stay connected with the students. Uh, but I have told my wife and others, now that I'm kind of shifting out of this very public role, uh, if people want to follow a little bit more of our, our, our kind of private uh, role and our leadership in terms of what we're doing next, I'm, I'm committed to being more of a Facebooker. Great. So Great. I think people could track that way, and we'll try to keep people updated on what we're Good. doing. Good, and we'll include all that information in the show notes so people know how to follow you there. Great. Matt, it's been an honor. Well, thank you, Brett. You're a great friend. You've been that since high school. You've uh, I've learned a lot from you. Uh, your listeners may not know this, but um, we were office mates together uh, at, at that Monitor Group experience. And from high school to post-college uh, life, uh, you've been an inspiration to me. And I, I wish you best with uh, this podcast and all that you're doing. I think it's a terrific service. Leadership makes all the difference in the world. We don't know enough about it. We need to help each other develop that more. And, and I, I just see this as a powerful tool for doing that.